Hey guys, so today we will be talking about um, Chapter 5, Forces. And this is going to be more of a review-oriented video, just because there weren't many application problems for this particular chapter. And we do have a test tomorrow, but it's going to be more conceptual-based problems, or um, I'm not saying there's going to be zero application problems on there, but it's mainly theory, and if you can you know, work with that theory. So I'm just going to go over some of the main topics of this chapter, and we're going to start with forces. So the most important thing about forces um, we need to realize are that there's four unique characteristics, and in order for it to be a force, it must meet all four of these criteria. So the first one is that it must be a push or pull on an object. So that's pretty um, logically sound and doesn't need too much explanation, just straightforward push or pull on an object. Um, the second one is that a force must be a vector quantity. Therefore, it must have a magnitude and direction. And this is really important because we need to, again, um, realize that a force, you know, it's kind of, it's a uh, vector quantity and it kind of defines your acceleration. So it that this is the thing which will be making your acceleration and your kinematic equations different. So force, vector quantity. Three, every force must have an agent. So what I mean by an agent is that there must be something which is exerting this force. So whether that be, um, in the case of gravity, it's the Earth itself. It's this massive object which is, um, its mass is attracting other objects. Therefore, we feel this pull towards the surface of the Earth or technically it would be towards the center of the Earth, but we get stopped by the crust. So we've got an agent, and the last part is that forces can be of two types, contact forces or long range. Um, the only long range force we'll be concentrating on in this class is the force gravity. And remember, it's F with a subscript of capital G. Now, that capital G was a big um, <laughs> kind of a... Uh, topic of discussion in our AP Physics class. I mean, someone wrote it as lowercase g and everyone started freaking out. Just remember, it's capital G. That's important. Notations are, you know, where most of your points are going to be coming from, besides the right answer. Um, so those are the four characteristics of a force. And um, what else do I want to think about? Okay, so one thing that we need to realize with the force is that just working with these last two things, so agents and contacts. So if I give you guys an example of a bowling ball rolling down the alley, like while it's in the middle, um, way before it knocks over the pins and way after you let go of it with your hand, what forces would be acting upon it? And a very common misconception is that there is this force of motion, oh, this mysterious force which is making it go towards the pin, which is giving it that positive direction. But in reality, the only three forces would be um, the friction, although it's minimal on a bowling alley, um, the force of gravity, and the normal force exerted upwards, which cancels out that gravity. So there, you have to realize there is no rightwards force in this bowling ball example. And that's really intriguing, and it kind of plays into Newton's first law where he says an object in motion stays in motion, object at rest stays at rest. So this idea that you don't really need a force to be moving. A force is just an acceleration. It's going to tell you if you're going to be slowing down or speeding up, but it doesn't necessarily tell you if you're moving or not moving, although you could obviously find those two things out dependent upon the forces that are present. Um, and you would have to be given other information actually besides just the forces present, some um, predetermined things that you should be given in the problem. But that's in, enough of me going off on that tangent. Um, the second main thing we need to focus on is friction. And the important thing about friction is that it's always tangent to the motion. So for example, if I've got this hill up here, I've got this little frog that I represented as a particle, and it's just sitting up there. Um, the intended, so it's going to be tangent to the intended motion or the actual motion. And that's where this uh, uh, kinetic friction and static friction comes into play. So if this uh, frog were moving, so if it were hopping down here or just walking down this hill, 
friction would be upwards and it would be a kinetic friction. But if it's just standing here, we know the intended motion would be downwards. So static friction as well is pointing upwards. And as you can see, it's, um, you could say tangent or parallel to that motion. And in, um, and rule of thumb for friction is it's always opposite to the motion or opposite to the intended motion. And there's this kind of like quirky little thing you could do to get out of that, which I'm going to be talking about here. But for now, we're just going to say it is always opposite to the motion, which is actually true. Um, then we get into this notion of static versus dynamic equilibrium. And first, we have to define equilibrium. So what is equilibrium? To us, equilibrium is just basically where the net force is going to equal zero. So the sum of all forces is going to be zero. And this could be two types. So static, which I like to remember as stagnant because they share the first three letters, um, where you're just sitting in one place, not moving at all, net force of zero, so you're not changing, you're not accelerating, you're just sitting there, static. But dynamic, you could be moving at a constant speed. And since you still have no forces um, acting upon you or no net force, actually that would be false. You could still have forces, but they cancel out, so you have no net force. You are moving with a constant velocity, therefore not accelerating and in dynamic equilibrium. Um, and this very last thing I wrote down here that I starred is kind of the mantra of this chapter. And it gets rid of basically misconceptions and if you approach a problem thinking about forces in this way, um, 70, uh, 7 out of 10 times you should just get a very sound conceptual basis of what the problem is actually asking. And that's this uh, this kind of phrase that constant force equals constant acceleration. So a misconception is that constant force is going to equal constant velocity. Um, for example, when I have this block down here, if I have a constant force of 5 newtons pointing in this direction, it does not mean my block is um, undergoing a constant velocity. Instead, it's saying that it's um, accelerating, in the, so constant acceleration. So, for example, we know Newton's second law is that the net force equals mass times acceleration. And so basically, if your mass goes up and your force stays 5 newtons, you know that your acceleration would be slower because larger objects, you know, inertia, first rule, going back to the first rule. And um, if your mass was smaller, then your acceleration would be greater. So we really need to focus on and hone in this um, conceptual understanding that forces relate to acceleration and that's why they affect the acceleration in your kinematic equations. It does, it does impact speed but it does not mean that you have a constant speed. That's completely false. Uh, now just to wrap it up real quick I want to go over three quick examples that I feel like are going to show up on the test and uh, so let's get started. So the first one would be um, a particle moves in the direction of the net force. And if you were giving this question with just two seconds to answer it, 100% of us would say yes. But if you actually think about it, you have to realize that the answer is no. The net force tells you the direction in which that particle is accelerating. So the direction in which the acceleration is pointing. This goes back to this force's acceleration. It's a vector quantity. And it's the direction of acceleration. So it could actually be, actually be pointing against the motion, hence slowing it down. But, and it just as well could be pointing with the acceleration and in the direction of, of motion. But this, this um, statement that it always points in the direction of motion is false because we have to realize that it points in the direction of acceleration. Uh, the second part, and this is the mind bender kind of thing, where it says an object or a particle moves in the direction, or a particle, can a particle move in the direction of friction? And coming back here, you know, we said that friction is always opposing motion, so it's always in the opposite direction. And right here, I, I mean, the first time I went over this, I answered no, but you have to realize that the answer is yes, because you could have these relative frames of references, which we learned about in chapter four. Um, for example, I have this neatly drawn out treadmill, which I am not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, but <laughs> this treadmill, and let's say we've got a frog represented the particle sitting right there. 
Now logically, the intended motion for this frog would be towards the left. So the static friction would be pointing against it and going towards the right. But now if we made this whole frame go into motion and start the treadmill, and that frog isn't going to move at all, it's just going to sit there, then the motion itself, the frog is moving towards the right, and that static friction is still towards the right. So, yes, we could be moving in the direction of friction. It just takes these um, separate frames, maybe some conveyors going on, or some different reference frames, and that's a mind bender, but um, as long as you remember this treadmill analogy, I think you should be fine for the test. Uh, the final thing I want to touch on is this definition of an inertial frame of reference. So, when we talk about inertial frames of reference, there's two key things and they kind of tie into each other. So, you just need to identify the frame where there is zero acceleration and it is at a constant speed. So, if on the test you see a multiple choice question that says identify the inertial frame of reference and you have this car and it says the car is moving at constant speed. Well, that checks off one of the boxes, so automatically it's in consideration for inertial frame. But we have to realize that acceleration is a vector quantity, so you could be altering your acceleration if you're turning. So the first check is making sure it's not, um, it's moving at a constant speed. Once that's checked, you have to make sure it's not turning. If it's not turning and it's moving at a constant acceleration, it is an inertial frame of reference. Um, despite I mean, it could be going up a hill or down a hill or, you know, something else, but in a straight line, moving at a constant speed, not turning, inertial frame of reference. And finally, all this stuff kind of ties into this really big abstract idea that Newton's laws only work in um, uh, frames with no acceleration. And wow, I wrote that really weird, but... Um, just we have to understand that Newton's laws only work in frames that are not accelerating. So they moving in constant speeds are not moving at all. And um, that's just a little like abstract idea that you know maybe it will be tested, maybe it won't, but it's good to know. And it definitely is the reason why all of this exists. So to finish it off, you know these are a quick you know run through of the parts or the ideas that I think are going to be highlighted heavily on the test. And this does not mean that there could be something here that's not going to be on the test and there could be stuff on the test that I didn't cover here. So this is just a quick refresher kind of study for you guys. And um, lastly, I would like to point out that my predictions apparently have a 0% um, success rate since I predicted that 88 was going to not be on the test but it ended up being on the test hopefully I could get that success rate up by seeing some of these things on the test which I have a suspicion they will but then again my suspicions kind of not that good but you know good luck on the test if you guys know this you should be more than ready for the test tomorrow